And I'm going to spotlight over to you now. All right. Wonderful. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome in. Welcome in. Make yourself comfortable. Turn on your camera if you feel comfortable doing so to wave hello. Welcome to Listening to the Library. This event is meant as a collective listening experience to a recent Fourth Space podcast episode in which Concordia Library's current researcher in residence, Dr. Catherine McLeod, sat down with John Latour to talk about the library as a sonic space of listening. Um, for those of you joining us for the first time at Four Space or virtual Four Space, I should say, welcome. We collaborate with our community to make Concordia research initiatives and course activities publicly accessible through engaging interactive experiences, hopefully such as today's. So we do welcome your participation throughout uh, and there will be a dedicated question period for you to participate in. I'll just note that we are recording and live streaming this session and we'll keep the, the view on active speaker for those recordings. So if you don't want your image captured, but you want to participate, why don't you put your ideas in the text format or just not turn on your camera and speak. You're welcome to participate in any way that you feel comfortable. So you know the rules. John is here to help us moderate the conversation. As we go through this listening experience, feel free to light up the chat with any kind of comments or reflections, feedback that you might have. And then as I mentioned, post-listening, there'll be a dedicated Q&A. Please feel free to raise your hand like this, raise your virtual hand if you want to speak, or simply continue using the chat for any reflections that you might have. Participation encouraged. On that note, I'm passing it over to our special guests. So Catherine and John, welcome. Over to you. Thank you very much, Anna. And uh, thank you very much for this invitation to, to come back and uh, to um, meet uh, as a group with this uh, Q&A. Um, Catherine, do you wanna, I'm, I should introduce myself, John Latour. I'm the teaching and research librarian at uh, Concordia Library. And uh, Catherine McLeod is our special guest today. Catherine, do you wanna say hi and? Yeah, hi, hello everyone. Um, it's great to be listening here with you all. Um, I am currently the researcher in residence at Concordia's library. Um, I did my PhD dissertation on Canadian poetry. I moved to Montreal to be part of the spoken web research project. I've um, written about poetry and recordings and I'm currently making recordings on uh, the spoken web podcast uh, feed called on a series called Shortcuts. Um, I also publish on poetry and recordings. I've edited a collection called Canlet Across Media on archiving the literary event. And I'm working on a book project uh, where I'm writing about women poets who read on CBC radio. So there's a lot of listening in my research and it's been a fantastic opportunity to be a researcher in residence at Concordia's library where my project is all about listening. It's all about thinking about the library as a sonic space. So when Fourth Space invited me to do an interview about uh, the project uh, as a podcast, I thought what a fantastic way to really listen to the library uh, together from a distance. So it means a lot to be able to um, not only listen together, but share this experience and get to talk about what we're hearing. And I'll be excited to hear from you afterwards uh, how you listen to the library and uh, to really share some, some ideas and recordings with each other. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be actually live listening and um, commenting a little bit in the chat. I'm going to throw some ideas in as we're listening, but you're welcome to not look at the chat too if you prefer simply to listen and have it be a purely auditory experience. So thanks everyone for listening. So I think we're going to start with the podcast. So thank you in advance, Doug, for setting that up. There's more thinking now about how academic research could look and sound. Thinking through how to listen to the library has been how to also produce something that is still reading, but the reading is still engaging all the senses. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Fourth Space podcast. Today's episode is a little special in the sense that we recorded this one in fourth space. John Latour and Catherine McLeod came into the space, socially distanced, but miked and in the same room to have uh, this discussion. So we're pretty happy to be able to do this. Hope you like this one.
Catherine McLeod researches archives, sound, and poetry, and she's an affiliated researcher with the Shirk-funded partnership of Spoken Web. Most recently, as a researcher in residence at the Concordia Library, Catherine is working on listening to the library, a sensory-based investigation into the audiovisual collections of the library. And John Latour is the teaching and research librarian in fine arts and is also a visual artist with an interest in artist books and the questions of open access. We invited Catherine to bring a selection of objects and sound recordings into the fourth space and try to make audible the sounds that are held within the Concordia Library collections and simultaneously to engage in conversation with John about reading or rather hearing the library as somatic. We would like to begin by acknowledging that Fourth Space and Concordia University are located on unceded Indigenous lands. The Cayuncahaga Nation is recognized as custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather, and Chichague, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. We respect the continued connections with the past, the present, and the future in our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. Hi, Catherine. Hi, John. It's so great to speak with you here in Force Space. It's so nice to be speaking with you. I'll start perhaps with some introductions. My name is John Latour, and I'm the Teaching and Research Librarian for Fine Arts at Concordia University. And it's my great pleasure to speak with Catherine McLeod today, our library's researcher in residence for 2020-2021. Catherine, before we talk about uh, the subject of your residency, can you say a few words about your experiences or interests that brought you here to this current project? Yes. So my research is on poetry, performance, and archives, and a project for the library residency called Listening to the Library. And it builds upon my work in thinking about uh, recordings of poetry readings, uh, and also to think more about um, performances of really of literature as a more embodied experience and how we might think about where and how we hear that in the library. I recently co-edited a collection called Canlet Across Media, Unarchiving the Literary Event that I co-edited with Jason Camlot, and it was published by McGill Queen's University Press in 2019. Uh, that idea of unarchiving that we talk about in that book has also influenced this library project because it's really about bringing recordings out into new publics and activating them in new ways. Nice, thank you. I can appreciate that it can be a challenge to talk about a research project while you're still immersed in it. Uh, but can you say a few words about how you plan to carry out your research in the library? Definitely. One of the challenges in particular has been that I've been listening to the library from a distance. So during our pandemic times, um, access to the library uh, has been very different from the usual kinds of access. So my project is still in its experimentation. And uh, one of the, the most experimental parts has really been thinking of how to listen to the library when not in the library itself. So a lot of my listening has been uh, from at home, uh, but that's been actually quite exciting to think about then how, how students, how users and researchers of, the, of uh, using the library are also accessing the library from a distance. And um, you know, my project started out with thinking about how to make audible the resources that are in the library. And so it's kind of an extra challenge to like make those resources audible from outside the library. And at the same time, I have been getting to really listen to some exciting things and discover some um, really interesting sounds as I've been going through my research and to also kind of experiment with the methods of doing that. Um, some of that experimentation has taken the form of short audio pieces. Other kinds of experimentation has been in writing some blog posts and also other kinds of experimentation has been diving into recordings that I might not usually listen to. I think when I first uh, read about your project, I was under the impression that you were only specifically listening to sounds, ambient sounds in the library. So I was really nicely surprised when I understood that you're also looking at sound recordings in the collection or audio files in the collection. So that's really great. I, I think you have brought in uh, a few things for us to listen to. But before perhaps we start listening to some of these uh, interesting samples, perhaps you could talk about the sounds that you hope to find or or how that has changed because of the COVID-19 situation? Well, I, I did hope to listen 
to the library in its physical space. So uh, that that's changed in and of itself. But I think that then it's it's you know it's it's been a, a productive challenge in in trying to listen and explore collections from a distance. So the idea of listening to the library and thinking of almost like the shelves themselves as being these like animated sonic spaces uh, came out of uh, teaching the library. And I do literally think of it as like teaching the library as a space. Uh, when I was teaching as an LTA at Concordia, I taught the course Intro to Literary Studies quite a few times. And I thought, well, let's let's go into the library and and look at it and think about it in more multisensory ways. And at the time, it just so happened that uh, the exhibit the library at night was happening and that uh, was based off of Alberto Manguel's book, uh, The Library at Night. And there was sort of this theatrical interest at that at that time in the library as this space that sort of tra could transform and become something other than the library. So uh, with that in mind, uh, my class and I headed across and that, that was back in 2016. And that was the first sort of exercise in the library of thinking about it as a really a sonic space and a space where you know looking at a blank or rather an empty shelf I said it blank is almost like a blank space on a page but an empty shelf and thinking you know what does that mean does it mean emptiness or does it mean possibility uh, when we the library was actually in the midst of its transformation at that time too so thinking what was the library going to transform into how how did users use the library was it a, a social space was it a quiet space and so this this idea of listening to the library really did start way back then uh, and then sort of combined with my interest in literary recordings but this idea that the library could be um, a very um, animated space but also a sonic space and a, really an embodied space and that's something that I've tried to bring in to my listenings and also the way that I've thought about the listening so that's why when thinking about how the the recordings could be activated, say, in a, in a short form, uh, which I've done as a, a, a short piece called Shortcuts that I produced through the Spoken Web podcast that it, you'll hear you'll hear about in a moment. So, but thinking like recordings can be activated in that way. But uh, something that I'd like to eventually get to is in the visualization room or the visualization studio at the library, just to experiment with projecting on the screen, moving in that space, thinking about that space is almost like a workshop for thinking about fully embodied experience of sound. So I still want to use that those spaces in the library to, to think through that more. Uh, but it certainly made me reflect more on where I listen and how I listen and even thinking about the sound of the library that I that I miss too. So uh, when I came in and I was able to listen to some of the tapes in the space of the library, uh, I actually recorded a sound of the elevators. Actually, maybe I'll play that for you as our first sound to listen to. We'll, we'll listen to the library. The clip that you're listening to now was recorded on March 19th, and you're about to hear me enter the elevators and then head down the sonic stairway. Now I'm walking towards the stairway and you're going to hear what's playing on this day in that stairwell. This is an audio stairwell that we have uh, set up at the entrance to the library, and it uh, is a chance for 
the library to play music or sound recordings or sometimes works of art as people make the transition into the library. So there you, you heard my footsteps heading down the stairs. I, w I was interested what it was like for you to hear that. Well, you know, I tend to think of libraries as a very quiet place, but it doesn't take long to realize that it can be kind of a busy place with ambient sounds in the background and, and uh, little bits of noise here and, here and there. You know, I think most people also think of it as quiet spaces, but they're actually very organic spaces. There are little, little lives and little uh, stories happening all around us. And I think by bringing in a recording device, you can pick up on these things that we, we tend to tune out, uh, or at least some people tune out. Yeah, and thinking too the then, especially with the library being even more quiet these days, going in to pick up a book from whether it's the contactless book pickup or getting to go up to interlibrary loans, uh, we really notice if you know if there is a voice speaking in the background, we'll, we'll perhaps notice it more. But uh, yeah, it was it was actually a very welcome a welcome sound to hear sound in the stairway, uh, while while entering and exiting the library. Well, I think our relationship to sound, it can vary from person to person. Like when I go to the library or when I was a student and I had to do research, I would look for the quietest spot and it was a moving spot because every day things would change. Um, I don't know, are you on a continuum of working in, do you prefer working in silence? Do you pre prefer having background noise? I do actually really like background noise, that, but it, it depends on the context because I, you know, I, I love working in cafes and I've, I really miss not being able to do that. Uh, and, you know, I love the hum of the, the, the background noise in a cafe while working. Uh, at the same time, for especially for listening closely and carefully to a recording, you really do need silence, uh, especially like even a good set of headphones. You realize, oh, there's there's even more. Um, texture to the voice than you might have picked up on in a in maybe in a noisier space. Been listening a, in more silent spaces these days, but uh, just missing missing a bit of the background noise and uh, um, you know sometimes maybe even recreating that with playing the radio in the background or something while while working. Well, in preparation for this conversation, I did a bit of research on ambient sounds in libraries, and apparently, if you do a, a search in uh, search engines like Google, ambient sounds in libraries, you can find that there there is kind of a growing fascination for people taping ambient sounds of, of libraries, uh, pages turning, chairs squeaking, things like that. And, and they can go on for hours. I was really fascinated to learn about this. Yeah, and people missing the, having that background to work to. So uh, yeah, being able to tune into the, the sort of the ambient sound and even to think then do different libraries they they would have different ambient soundscapes you can and even non in non covid times that might be something to you know experiment with in as background to, for work well i think these recordings are a way to kind of bring the library to your own space as well especially during covid-19 um i can see on a table nearby that you brought in some goodies for us uh, to listen to yes <laughs> would you like to talk about some of the items that you brought in yes so there are quite a few sound objects, and I use that phrase uh, on purpose because one of the books that is in this collection is called Sound Objects. Uh, it's a book that is an edited collection um, by James Steintrager and Ray Chow about thinking about objects as sound objects and what it means to think of a sound, a sonic object. Um, so. In addition to the book Sound Objects, there's a, a couple cassette tapes, there's a LP, there's a book that has a CD that comes with it, there's a poem that is about a recording, there is also a copy of Canlit Across Media Unarchiving the Literary Event that I thought was an appropriate object to have as sort of a, a reminder of the unarchiving that's taking place in listening to these recordings. So I actually, I'd love to be able to play you a couple of these. Um, and the, the one that I'm going to start with is one that I had to actually listen to in the library because my tape recorder was broken at home. So it was uh, one of those the moments when uh, getting to come into the library and listen on a tape recorder. Uh, this is how I first heard this, uh, this recording, which I think was also very exciting because it was like finding something on a tape 
from the library, but also in the library, <laughs> which was listening to the library in the library. So um, before I play the tape, I will, or before I play the recording, um, the other thing that I'll say about it is that it connects to the poem that I also have displayed here, which is, so the poem's called Without Benefit of Tape, and it's by the Canadian poet Dorothy Livesey. This is a poem, again, to connect things back with teaching that um, I, in the course uh, English 378, which is a course on Canadian poetry, uh, I taught this poem without benefit of tape. And I realized when teaching the poem that this poem really expresses what it means to listen to poetry and the, the, the really the idea in it that she says, you know, poetry is living speech this idea that like the poem expresses this 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 real animated quality of poetry um, and i thought this was interesting because it is it is a poem on a page so the idea that i have this i have this poem here in the printed version saying you know the, the living speech is shouted out and that that's on the page uh, i have it as a, as a poem because that's the only way that i'd ever heard it or encountered the poem there i'd heard many recordings of lives read but never had she read this poem but when I was listening in the library to this recording that was made by, uh, it's a recording made by the League of Canadian Poets that's called Modern Canadian Poets, a Recorded Archive. And it was one of the, the cassettes that I found in the, um, the catalog here at the Concordia Library. And I re it was one of the first things that I requested. So yeah, let's, uh, let's take a listen. Yeah. And there's a, even a sound to taking a cassette out of its box and putting it into a Walkman, I think. That's yes. what it is. <laughs> I know there's something about just that sound of opening, the, opening that case, putting it in. I think I've got it set up here for Dorothy Livesey to read the poem without benefit of tape. And I'd like you to imagine uh, listening to this this recording of Livesey. I didn't, so this, this cassette, it doesn't list the poems that are going to be on it. So I had no idea that this was coming at the end. And it was the, it's the last poem that she reads uh, in this reading. And um, I the poem that I brought in, or the, the printed version, I've actually had up on my wall. So oh, nice. then to, uh, to hear the poem uh, it, uh, read out loud, it was, um, it was a really very inspiring moment of listening. So here she is. I'll end with a poem about poetry. I called it without benefit of tape because I felt uh, poetry is living even though it's not being recorded. It's living in this country, Canada. And, uh, but uh, John Robert Colombo didn't like the title at all and he's using it in some anthology and giving it the title of The Poem. You can take your choice. The real poems are being written in outports, on backwoods farms, in passageways where pantries still exist, or where geraniums nail light to the window, while out of the window, boy in the flying field is pulled to heaven on the keel of a kite. Stories breed in the north. Men with snow in their mouths trample and shake at the bit, kneading the woman down under blankets of snow, icing her breath, her eyes. The living speech is shouted out by men and women leaving railway lines to trundle home, pack sacked, just company for deer or bear. Hallooed across the counter in a corner store, it booms upon the river's shore. On midnight roads where hikers flag you down, speech echoes from the canyon's wall, resonant, indubitable. Oh, wow, that was wonderful. Yeah. It was so nice to hear the poet read her own poetry and even the comments that she made before. It kind of adds a new dimension to the to the writing. It did. And when she mentioned that it had been published with a different title, I had no idea about that. And so that was something that I learned only only recently from from hearing that. Also to uh, Dorothy Livesey is one of the poets that uh, read at what was the Sir George Williams poetry reading series that took place here at Concordia when Concordia was Sir George Williams. And that collection has been digitized and it was really the first audio collection that uh, started the Spoken Web project, which is a project that I'm 
affiliated with as a researcher. Uh, it's um, a collection that is available online. And so uh, Livesey's reading is, a, is one that I've taught, but also I've selected some cuts from to feature as part of the shortcuts audio um, series that I produce for the Spoken Web podcast. And so Livesey, someone who I've, I've listened to a lot and, and thought a lot about her, her poetry out loud. And so to get to sort of discover this recording of Livesey reading without benefit of tape, which is a poem so much about can you record poetry or not, or does it just live in this, the living speech of the poem itself? Uh, it was really, really such a fascinating, uh, fascinating experience and something that um, I'm going to continue to think and reflect upon more too. Would it be safe to say that uh, the research that you're doing with the listening in the library project is kind of or will inform your teaching or vice versa? Will your teaching inform your research? Yes, it's, it certainly will. I think to the thinking just of this example that uh, if I were to be teaching this poem again without benefit of tape, uh, I would I would bring in this recording and we would think about what, you know, what does the, the opening introduction that she gave, how does that influence our listening to the, to the poem? Uh, but I'm not currently teaching. And so I, you know, I, I feel like I'm amassing more resources to be able to use when back in the classroom. One of the other objects that I brought in is it's not, I didn't bring it particularly for its, you know, for its content, but more for its representation of the fact that often you take a book out of the library and realize, oh, it has a CD in the back or the, or you have to go to the desk and find, it might say like, go to the, you know, the, the circulation desk to access this, the disc that comes with it. Oh yeah. And this one says check book for, for discs. So making sure not only to take it out, but also when you're returning it. So this book is called Sound Voice Perform. And uh, it's um, a, a book that's really more about sound art. There's, there's all kinds of photographs and there's all kinds of more experimental pieces in it in terms of the, the text, but there's also this disc at the back that, you know, is this invitation to listen to pieces. And this is something that, um, you know, what I, I've always interested when, when you get a disc that comes with a book, do people put it on first or do they read the book first or, you know, how do, it's, it's this interesting moment when you have to kind of navigate, okay, am I going to read the book and then listen in appropriate moments or listen first or, you know, not even listen at all. If sometimes people will just, just sort of um, still read the book as the book and the, the, the audio component becomes somehow secondary to it. So that's something too, that in thinking about the research that I'm doing, uh, I'd really, you know, like to have the audio integrated with it. So um, I think about this when, when writing about audio recordings of poetry readings, how to integrate that audio into the actual uh, research that you're creating. And I think that there's, there's more thinking now about how academic research could look and sound different when it's when it's based around sound itself so uh, I think that this the sort of again the experiments in thinking through how to listen to the library has been sort of thinking okay how to how to also listen and how uh, how can the, the the listening produce something that is still sonic based rather sound based it's it's some, not something that then just becomes about reading but the reading is is still is still multidisciplinary it's still engaging all the senses I have to say that this has been a wonderful experience. Thank you so much, Catherine, for bringing in these materials and for sharing your research with us. Thank you so much, John, for having this conversation with me about the materials. Uh, I think that uh, talking about recordings is such an important part of listening. So thank you. Would you like to make a final selection to end uh, this conversation? Yes, it's a tough choice, but I'm going to choose a clip of poet Muriel Rukeyser, uh, the poet that I had mentioned earlier as sort of the one uh, creating connection across archives. It is a clip of her reading Elegy in Joy, and we're going to hear her just say that she's never quite read it like this before, but she wanted to read it this way tonight, and she was reading it in January 1969 here at Sir George Williams University, which is now Concordia. I just really love the last words, uh, the almost last words of the poem when she says, every elegy is the present. And that's something that really came across in her decision to end it where she ends it in this reading, because in the actual poem itself, it goes on. But here we really hear those words and they ring out and um, they are resonant 
indubitable, to quote Dorothy Livesey's Without Benefit of Tape. So here's Muriel Rukeyser to end off our listening. Here's one piece of a long poem. It's the last of a group called Elegies, which one hardly dares name anything anymore. It's called Elegy and Joy, and it's just the beginning piece. I wanted to do it tonight this way. I've never cut it up. Elegy and Joy. Now green, now burning, I make a way for peace. After the green and long beyond my lake, among these fields of people, on these illuminated hills, gold, burnt gold, spilled gold, and shadowed blue, the light of enormous flame, the flowing light of the sea, where all the lights and nights are reconciled, the sea at last, where all the waters lead and all the wars to this peace. For the sea does not lie like the death you imagine. The sea is the real sea, here it is. This is the living, this peace is the face of the world, a fierce angel who in one lifetime lives fighting a lifetime, dying as we all die, becoming forever the continual God. Years of our time, this heart, the binding of the alone, bells of all loneliness, binding our lines and our music. Branches full of motion, each opening in its own flower. Lines of all song, each speaking in its own voice. Praise in every grace among the old same war. Years of betrayal, million death breeding its weaknesses and hope buried more deep, more black than dream. Every elegy is the present, freedom eating our hearts, death and explosion and the world unbegun. If you have an idea for a podcast, please let us know. You can contact us by email at info4 at concordia.ca or on social media at cu4thspace. We'd love to hear from you. The podcast is hosted by me, Douglas Moffat, and produced by Anna Vaklovec. Editing by Chloe Lalonde and Mackay Halkro. Social media and web support by Kari Balmstead. Our theme music is courtesy of Supercontinent. Thank you for listening. And we're back. Yeah. Thank, <laughs> Pastor, you thank you so much for, for um, uh, bringing that uh, poem by uh, Muriel Ruckhauser to our attention. It's always extra special to hear an artist uh, read or perform their poetry. Mm -hmm. And I think just even like seeing Clara Duplessis comment about uh, the, what a powerful poem it is, it just uh, I, it, it is amazing every time hearing it, just how moving, how moving it is to, to hear. So. I was uh, delighted that it worked to share that as the final um, sonic object in our conversation. Um, it also struck me as we were listening that the objects that I brought in for that interview, all they do literally surround me here <laughs> in my office at home. And so when I talked about the poem on the wall, I looked over and saw it on the wall. And I, you know, I have the sort of stack of books, the sound related books next to me, I have the tape sitting here. And so, um, you know, as much as I'm listening to the library from a distance and not in the library, I feel like these sonic objects are so much a, a, a part of the space in which I'm working and listening from in, 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 in attempts to, to sort of inspire me by, by seeing them and hearing them around me. But, uh, but it, just, it just struck me as, um, you know, what a, a space to be listening to this from and talking about it with, with these objects around me. So uh, um, I just wanted to share that for the listeners here that uh, I can see these things again <laughs> as, I'm, as I'm speaking. And they do show up in the photograph for the event if you're 
uh, kind of keen to, to see these, these sonic objects in their physical form. Great, thank you. So yeah. up until now, I've been asking all the questions, but perhaps our listeners or our participants um, would like to ask some questions to Catherine. So you're, everyone is more than welcome to uh, put in questions, either through the chat or to raise your hand physically or through uh, electronic hand raising. And uh, so please uh, take a moment and, and, uh, and uh, ask away. But uh, perhaps in the meantime, uh, I just wanted to uh, let people know if they have favorite sounds of their own in the library, they should let us know, or you know, favorite spots in the library, that would be yes. great. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned in, your, in, in, the, in our earlier segment uh, this uh, book that you co-edited with Jason Canlock, Can Lit Across Media on Archiving the Literary Event. And I just wanted to mention, librarian that I am, that we do have a copy of that in the library, and it's an ebook. So if people are interested, they can uh, check it out. Uh, they just go to our library website, library.concordia.ca, and do a search in our uh, catalog, Sophia, and uh, they should be able to access it from home. So Thank I you for like sharing that. That's that's fantastic to know. That's that's great. Um, it looks like Clara might have a question, but I also before we go into questions, I want to just reiterate what John said that um, you know part of getting to meet and listen and talk about this is in fact to get to find out about more sounds in the library. So I'll be really i love I would love to hear if you have a favorite either sound or something that you think that researchers really need to know about this sound and we need to pay attention to it. So do do share those as well. Um, but yeah, Clara, do you wanna start us off with a question? Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for sharing that work with us. And it's been really wonderful to just hear some of your research from your residency at, at the library. I've been curious for, for half a year or whatever. <laughs> uh, so it's been wonderful. Um, and I really just wanted to also say that I loved um, the kind of image that accidentally entered your podcast of um, the silence in the library as kind of like a blank space or a blank page or something. It was uh, it was very evocative. Um, but yeah, I just wanted wondered if you could um, talk a bit more about the kind of virtual listening that you're doing or, or practically what it even means <laughs> to listen to the silence in the library virtually if you're not able to access the space and whether that means that you're getting recordings of the space or anyway, just I would don't, I won't prompt that, but I'm just really curious to hear about like the practical act of yeah. finding sound through absence, I guess. Yeah, I'm so glad that you asked that. Um, I should also say that uh, uh, Claire Duplessis is a poet who is doing an event tomorrow at Art Text, and I feel like the the event that you're doing tomorrow, I feel like it's like the physical version of thinking of like the sound. It's like looking at art artist books and like the just the the actual shape of those books. So do check out Art Text if you are interested in that. Um, and uh, that's something you know when thinking about. Um, the sound in the library, I, you know, the reason that that art text exhibit and curation comes to mind is to think about the ways in which maybe even just like the physical object could also be evoking either a silence or a sound and that it's, and I don't only want to think about books that either have recordings or recorded materials, but actually then, you know, the, the idea of like the page as being silent or sonic, like I think that, that could, that's also part of what I'm thinking about. Uh, but to get to the more practical question of like how to access these things and, and you know thinking about listening to the library from a distance, um, something that it's made me think a lot about is um, is in fact access to recordings and kind of the, like the limits of where the library starts and ends. Um, and this is something that's actually inspired uh, a more formal talk that I am going to give um, through the library in July. So I'm starting sort of this is it has the seeds the seeds of that but then so the idea of like okay if we're thinking if the library like where does it start and where does it end I think that sound is such a, a fascinating way to explore that question because uh, when we think of you know being able to stream audio through uh, having searched something through the catalog so 
I think of how Concordia Library actually is subscribed to so many uh, sound resources, whether it's through like um, Smithsonian recordings, especially around um, various folk songs around the world and sort of these ethnographic recordings of sound. Um, you can get such rich resources through simply through the catalog. And then once you're logged in, you can listen to these things. Or even um, I think, you know, jazz recordings I was, I wanted to find, like, to see if, oh, okay, is there some Oscar Peterson recordings through the Concordia Library to, like, get it local and think of local artists. And yeah, you can listen to, you can listen to Oscar Peterson because of the ways that Concordia Library has subscribed to various um, subscriptions through, um, so I think that there, like, we're, we're accessing something that's not even necessarily located in the library, but it can be um, channeled through the library and we access it through the library and it's not, from having to actually even go to the library. It's because of being able to log in. And then that made me think, okay, how is that kind of like, like interlibrary loans? That's kind of like the physical version of this in that, um, you know, I can, one of the records that I did request came from the University of Lethbridge. And so I was able to access that through the Concordia Library, but it's not actually part of the Concordia collection. And so then I thought, okay, well then like, you know, even on a physical level, like that's almost the same version of streaming because you're like, I'm getting this thing that's a sonic object from another library. Um, and so it made me think of the ways that like sound is like move, it moves through libraries and it's like, you have to, it has to be held by some collection, but it doesn't have to necessarily like stay in that collection. Um, and that just made me think, oh, like maybe libraries are sort of like, they're more porous than we might think. And maybe right now having to especially like listen, like engage with the library from a distance, you're really able to think about the ways that materials and sort of our the knowledge moves through it and out of it and what is sort of keeping it either attached to a single library or to like the library system more generally. Um, so I think I, I, my hypothesis is that sound is like this interesting, this medium through which to think about like the, the where the library begins and ends and also who's kind of you know, controlling the knowledge that's moving through it and circulating through it, um, you know, and even thinking like, can can a collection ever like hold hold a voice or hold something that is that really moves beyond that? So, um, so I think you know, the, both the the sort of the the streaming service and the interlibrary loan. I feel like they they might sound like such different things, but I think they have a lot in common. And um, yeah, I'm, I I like this idea of like the porousness of the library. That's something I've been been working on and uh, thinking about what kinds of questions that that invites um, and also thinking you know um, even just among library systems and circulation uh, to what extent is it important to have an object attached to a particular library because like say my record from the University of Lethbridge like what if it just stayed here <laughs> or like what if what if uh, what's of course, like I'm sure Lethbridge would be like, okay, please return this at some point. But and so what what is um, the value in still having objects attached to libraries, even though we have such a um, much more porous circulation system now um, and much more collaboration between libraries. And I'd be happy to hear from people with with opinions on this, too. So uh, I think it was a great, a great question. Thank you. Well, definitely the, uh, the COVID-19 has had a huge impact on the way in which we access uh, the collection for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, for people who are Concordia listeners today or Concordia mm -hmm. participants, there are ways you can kind of bridge that, uh, that distance. So again, I'll do a little plug for our library catalog and our collection. You can do a search, you know, a subject search on the word poetry or music and then um, limit your search to sound recordings. And you'll find out that we have hundreds and hundreds of uh, sound recordings that uh, people can access. And some of them are digitized so they can be accessed from home. So this is kind yeah. of interesting. Also, actually, just to, to add to this too, and thinking of like the ways that during COVID-19, not only like we, we've been accessing the library through the catalog system from home more than we might have been before, um, and perhaps, you know, finding things that were there all along, but we just, you know, we, we maybe wouldn't have um, searched, searched for them, uh, but also through special collections on a, on a very practical level um, that um, I've been in touch with special collections at Loyola and um, they have very generously sent me files to listen to. So that was something that pre-COVID, I probably would have gone and listened to them there. And 
now to be able to listen to them at home, it's it's um, it feels uh, it feels kind of like a treat, or like it feels like something that I I perhaps you know have more time to be able to listen to them in the comfort of my home as opposed to just want because sometimes you know you listen to them once you try to take as many notes as you can and then you leave and um, and then so the difference of being able to listen to it at home really then you can listen to it again um, and that's just like on, again on a practical level um, I had to sign an agreement that I was only using it for educational purposes and research purposes. So I think there's there's ways that the library is, you know, trying to account for the fact that we can't go in and listen, but also to make things available that are still respecting the various copyright um, laws or also the various, um, you know, um, specifications that relate to particular phones and different recordings. So it's an it's an interesting moment for archival access because. Um, sometimes, you know, that it, there's, you might not want to be just sending out recordings, but during this time, we kind of have to do that. So that's, it's become a little more porous in that, in that way. Um, um, what if yeah. a, one of our participants uh, a little earlier had uh, asked a question, and I think you did answer it in the chat, uh, Faye, but she did raise kind of an interesting question. Um, yeah. you know, uh, during this sort of period when the library was kind of closed to the public and before students could reserve a spot it was, it was a bit of a ghost town but mm -hmm. you know sometimes uh, staff do come in uh, and do work but um, she made a comment in the chat that you know it was so quiet you could almost hear your uh, your, your own you could hear your own footsteps or perhaps you could hear your own um, heartbeat um, but I think it's very interesting too. The sound of silence also makes you very aware of your own body in space as well. Yeah, and also her point made me think of how um, going into the library when before students were back, or just even in those early times, it felt like you like you had to have a, a really specific reason. And like I remember when I went and I did listen on the with the media cart um, in the staff area, I felt very like as if I was sort of somehow intruding into the space because nobody else was there. And so you feel like maybe you're not supposed to be there, but you actually you're like, well, wait, well I do have this reason to be here, but it just feels like the emptiness makes makes yourself all the more prominent and also your reason for being there. Like you can't just sort of be like browsing we think of like browsing the shelves and that that luxury um is um you know just something that we we can't do really um maybe eventually i noticed that in the the um the library memo about um, recent changes that you can book an appointment to be able to to browse the shelves but just thinking that you know that luxury of browsing that um it's something that maybe we've taken for granted but um sort of suggests a kind of leisure in the space which we're, we're kind of more like on, on edge or thinking, oh, am I, should I be here? Should I, should I be, am I doing things right? Um, so I definitely felt that when I went in and I just, I think it was just unavoidable because of, because of the time. Yeah. Yeah. And Faith, or sorry, Faith um, saying very true. I felt that I had to do what needed to be done and then leave. Yeah, exactly. And feeling like no lingering around. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, if the fates are on our side, hopefully we'll be able to go back to campus in some capacity in the fall and the, mm -hmm. the library collection and the study areas will reopen again. So this is great and people can start browsing again. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of curious, Catherine, um, if there is this uh, return to the collections, if you can freely browse the collections or move through the spaces, um, how, would you, how would you get back into your on-site uh, research in the library? Yeah, I think I will. I'm, I'm hoping that even towards the end of the summer, maybe I can squeeze one of these experiences in. Uh, so my um, my residency technically ends at the end of August, but um, I've I know that the Concordia Library has been very supportive of researchers in residence uh, beyond the, the the timeline of their residency. So especially given the constraints during this one, um, I know that there's support to be able to still come in and, and that's particularly spaces like the visualization room. Um, I had dreamed of doing something both with a visualization of sound, but also with movement and the way that the speakers in that space um, are positioned in different places and you know create sound and we really to play with that um, through some remixing of archival sound. Um, so yeah, I feel like if even if I do it as a bit of a um, work in progress and then present it more publicly, a year later or something that I'd really like to 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 do something with that space 
Um, the other thing that, you know, I'd imagine when imagining that we could just we're, you know, COVID was going to be over short in a short time, which of course was not the case, was actually recording myself like speaking while moving through the different spaces and almost doing kind of like this walking, um, not, not necessarily walking tour, but just like a, almost like a sound walk through the library and thinking about some of these different spaces just with like a Zoom recorder and recording some of these spaces. So that's the thing that like maybe just even at the end of the summer, if we can move more freely through the space and there's some people in it to kind of get that that sound that sound um, i'd love to do that um, also on it to something that i can do without necessarily being in the space but something i'm looking forward to is um, this summer there are um, yeah there are two interviews that i'd love to do with concordia researchers who use the library and the sound um, in different ways. So one is um, with Rachel Harris, who um, I really want to ask her about, you know, um, especially dance recordings and sort of to get into the more um, multi-sensory to think about sound recordings, you know, that could relate to dance. Um, also just generally the, the music collection. Um, and also um, to, to give Clara DePlessis another shout out here that uh, um, I was speaking with Clara about wanting to do a little interview to talk about the vacuole press uh, recordings that are in special collections. So if I can do those recording, those, um, sorry, interviews remotely, um, I'll, you know, save the other things for, for when, it's, when it's safe to do so. Um, I am going to share the link to the blog that I have been you know, posting little short reflections on uh, because when I do those interviews I will put them there. Um, and the last thing I'd add is that um, John Latour and I have been speaking about the stairway and that maybe that will be a way to get uh, some of this sound into the space of the library itself. So um, if next year you're walking up the stairway and maybe you even hear that Dorothy Livesey poem or the Muriel Rukeyser or um, something, you hear my voice in there <laughs> introducing something, uh, that's, that's what you'll be hearing, something inspired by this, this listening to the library, um, which is also why I'm excited to, to get um, recommendations too of, of good sounds to check out. So um, I'm gonna just share that link to the blog posts in the chat. Maybe while you're doing that, I can um, just give a, a little more context to this uh, audio stairwell. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it came up uh, during our earlier conversation, but it was uh, inaugurated in 2017 as part of this larger renovation of the Webster Library. I think I mentioned it's a transitional space, so um, it kind of uh, creates a bridge between the outside world and, and the library. And as you walk up the stairs, you can start to hear noise or sound or music or uh, poetry being spoken. So there are hidden speakers and as you go up the stairs you can kind of be transported uh, to another place and uh, there's even a little monitor at the top of the uh, staircase so we can actually present um, audio visual as well as audio material. So this is uh, you know something that gets programmed throughout the year and it would be really wonderful if Catherine could help uh, program you know and, and to share some of your research uh, using the audio stairwell. Yeah, I definitely I'm look, looking forward to to um, co sort of composing that <laughs> that mix for the stairway. Yeah, thank you for that that opportunity. And it'll be great to have that that'll sort of in many ways be a culmination of listening to the library in the library. So it'll be a full sort of meta experience in that. <laughs> so that would be great. Um, did would anyone like to share some favorite or not even favorite, but again, like the sounds that researchers need to know about that are in the in the library or accessible through the library we actually yeah. have a zero noise room in the library <laughs> as well and you're not even supposed to go t -t -t with a with a computer or keyboard so that's kind of one of my favorite spots in the library but as i you know mentioned i'm kind of a no sound kind of person but I think you're uh, kind of on the other end of that continuum. Yes. So you're there, you're not, you're, it, it not even if typing. I could have a cone of silence yeah. around me <laughs> <laughs> where the sound of my thoughts would be like really loud. That would be wonderful. But um, yeah. I do, I do in sound, enjoy some sounds, I have to say, in the library. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm kind of opposite end of the scale. Yeah. Uh, 
um, thinking too of just thinking of different um, different examples of sounds like thinking just physically because I have, I have these tapes here like thinking when imagining taking a sound out or accessing a sound through the collection like what does one do you think of a tape or do you think of um, clicking on uh, a stream that gets you know you you connect through the catalog and just even thinking those those two differences do you think of the object or do you think of connecting um, connecting to something um, or indeed do you think of the noise the noises surrounding one um, in the library so I, yeah I'm, I'm, you don't have to answer but I'm, I'm intrigued as to um, you know your take on on this um, also thinking those things those objects or the really are the access to those sounds um, often come from such different historical moments too thinking of what sort of um, either historical um, context surrounds the sound, whether it's coming through a stream or through a tape and what kind of knowledge we have about that. Because, um, you know, thinking if say if you're streaming something, how would how do you then go and find out, you know, what's the context for this sound versus um, a tape? What kind of context do you get given in the liner notes or sometimes very little context and you have to sort of do a different kind of digging around to find the context for that sound. So. Um, maybe that's something I invite you to think about as you encounter sounds um, through and in the library is uh, how, how you understand that sound in its context and how you go about um, learning about the context from which that, that sound emerges. Including sounds made in the library. Yeah, that Clara has shared um, a reading that was organized by Toronto poet Margaret Christakos. In, the in one of the, the libraries at the University of Toronto a couple of years ago. Um, and yeah, thinking of how library spaces can be activated in different ways. It makes me think of the, um, the Friends of the Library Room. I'm a huge fan of the Friends of the Library Room at Concordia's library. Um, I've organized um, some listening sessions actually in that space. Um, when I was in LTA, I organized a poetry listening to Gwendolyn McEwen and Phyllis Webb. Um, it was the 50th 50 years since they had read um, in Montreal. And uh, I thought, let's just gather and listen to this. So Friends of the Library Room was a perfect space for organizing that listening. And uh, I've been part of conferences that have used that room in various ways. So I think that, you know, that space when thinking of how you can, you can activate library spaces in different ways and actually make some noise. It's a, it's a great space to, uh, to, to do that in. And, you know, I look forward to returning back to that space when we can. So. Well, I think I can say on behalf of everyone that uh, we're all looking forward to seeing how your research evolves and uh, changes, and we'll keep an eye out for your blog as well. Um, this has been a great follow-up to our uh, conversation that we had uh, not long ago. Thank you very much, Catherine, for sharing your research around listening to the library. And I'd like to thank everyone who joined today uh, for your comments and your questions. And thanks again to the fourth space the wonderful people, Anna Vaklovic and Douglas Moffat for this chance to bring us together. You're awesome. Yes. And if I had a mic, I don't, this is a pencil, but if I had a mic, I would pass it on to Anna and Douglas. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, there it is. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, thank you for the shout out. And it's been, and apologies, the sun has finally reached me, but it's been a, a great experience for us to, to work with you and connect you. You hadn't met before this experience. So um, thank you again for coming into the space and helping us activate it in uncertain times. We look forward to being back in there in the fall and um, recording more live conversations with live audiences. Uh, hopefully, we're all very optimistic around here. But uh, <laughs> Catherine, we've we've appreciated you sharing your work with us throughout this residency, and we uh, look forward to reconnecting, perhaps in the in the finale uh, uh, and on other projects. And everybody, thank you for your time to to come into a Zoom to to listen together. That's been really great. Thanks very much. So, John, Catherine, thank you. We look forward to working with you again soon. Okay, bye. Thank everybody. you so much, Anna. Thank you, everyone. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks,